I'm Heather, and this is the Living with Addiction podcast, where I show you how you have more power than you realize when it comes to helping yourself and your child that's struggling with addiction. Hello, hello. How's everybody doing? So funny, just before I hit record for this, um, I had forgot to turn the ringer off of my, on my phone off. And so my phone rang and it was a no caller ID number. And you know, like my heart skipped a beat because (laughs) you guys know those calls are never good. Every time my daughter called me from a blocked number or a no caller ID number, it was always a long night. So seeing that on my phone gave me a few flashbacks and it wasn't her. It was a telemarketer, but it definitely startled me for a second. And I thought it was funny because I was just getting to do this podcast and I know you guys can probably totally (laughs) relate to those kinds of calls. But anyway... I'm back again. (laughs) Do you remember that movie Groundhog Day with Bill Murray where he woke up and it was the same day over and over again every day? (laughs) Well, that's what the last few months have felt like for me. Every time I've started working again and I tell you guys I'm back and I'm feeling great and everything is okay, I end up needing another surgery and having to start over. And that happened again (laughs) two weeks ago. I was on a call with a client and I had not, I had really not been feeling great, but I was just trying to push my way through it. And I just kept thinking it's because of all the surgeries. My body just needs time. You know, I was trying to make reasons to just keep going (laughs) and try to push through it. So I was on a call with a client and I must have been like super, super focused because I hung up the call and I realized that my clothes were totally soaked and I hadn't even felt anything. And so I was totally confused. I like, I looked up at the ceiling. I thought maybe there was a leak or something and there wasn't and you know, my brain's just going a hundred miles an hour. And then I thought maybe one of my tissue expanders was leaking, but I was still confused because the saline still should have been staying in my body. Like it just wasn't making sense. Well, it turned out that I had such a bad infection that it caused my incision that was healed to open and so that the infection could drain out of my body, which was shocking when I realized what happened. So I had to, you know, cancel my next calls for that day and go have immediate surgery that day to have my tissue expanders removed and get the infection cleaned out. So that's why there hasn't been a podcast for a few weeks. I, um, of course, I just had to take some time to recover once again. But I feel so much better now that I don't have that infection in my body. I've been fighting it since probably like two weeks after my first surgery, since the middle of June. I've been on some kind of antibiotic or something trying to you know, fight it. So at this point, my reconstruction journey is over for the rest of the year, which um, on one hand is incredibly disappointing. Um, So I'm allowing all the tears and feelings, all the, like I say, you know, I'm just sitting with how I feel about it whenever it comes up for me. And on the other hand, I'm also super focused on creating as much as possible in the next five months and really enjoying my life because, you know, I've got to stay flat for at least three months so my body can heal and then try again. And after everything I've been through with breast cancer and the after effects, I just want to enjoy my life for a little while. Like, you know, having a breast cancer diagnosis 
pulls into focus how important it is to live each day. And then while I was laying there healing, I just kept thinking, you know, I want to be out living my life. So the next couple of months, I'm going to live it up. <laughs> and I'm going to help as many parents as I can and just see what I can create. I lost 30 pounds before my surgery. So between my breast cancer diagnosis and my surgery, I'd lost 30 pounds and I want to lose more weight and focus on just being as healthy as possible. And I want to go see my daughter. She is four months sober, which is incredible. I am so, so proud of her. And I think I'm going to be strong enough to make the drive in a few weeks. And I cannot wait to hug her and look at her and laugh with her. So that's where I am. And I am living my life by everything that I share with you guys. Everything that I tell you guys to do, I am doing for myself to get through the situation um, and really be able to still have as much quality of life as possible for myself. And that's what I want to keep doing and sharing with you guys and so that you can create that same quality of life and happiness for yourselves as well. And... So you're all caught up on me. You're stuck with me now. <laughs> I'm excited that I'm going to get to be here every week again. And today I was going to do a Q&A where I answer questions that I get from emails and messages, but I only got to the first question and I decided, okay, I can do a whole podcast on that question. And I'm summarizing the question, but the basis of it is everything my, sa my child says is a lie. And will I ever be able to trust them again? And so many parents, right, when you're dealing with addiction or just <laughs> kids in general or teenagers sometimes, right, we have to wonder if we can trust them and will we ever be able to trust them again because there's just so much lying and chaos that goes hand in hand with addiction. But I love this question because it shows how we're always focused on everything outside of us. This person who wrote this question their focus is on their child and will their child change enough that they can trust them again? And my answer to that is that they're asking the wrong question. But before I get to the right question, I want to say a few things about the lies. I want to offer you some perspective about the lies that our kids tell when they're going through addiction and maybe even in recovery sometimes. But a different perspective will help you have a different approach. I mean, what if you could take the emotional charge out of your child's lies? What if they had no effect on you emotionally? I mean, can you imagine that freedom? I know some people who lose their mind over lies and have this huge fear of being lied to. But, it, you know, nobody wants to be lied to, of course, but is it worth losing all of your personal peace over? Is it worth being in that much fear of? There were some things that were easier for me to handle with my daughter because I had already gone crazy <laughs> about them with her dad many years before. So if you're new to listening to this podcast, my daughter's father was an alcoholic and he was sober and in active addiction throughout our marriage. And I spent a lot of time in going to AA and Al-Anon meetings um, during that marriage. And so I had gone through a lot of these things with him 
and acted out and acted crazy over being lied to and many other things. So when you hear me talk about things with my daughter, I didn't have I wasn't going through those initial stages of dealing with addiction. I already had some, um, you know, experience with it. But with my daughter, it was just this was just a whole nother level with her, a whole nother level of pain and needing to learn the right way to deal with it. And of course, I was totally focused on her. But a lot of the really acting out um, you know, not being proud of my actions at all is stuff that happened in that marriage. So I never really lost my mind over her lying because I'd already gone through it with her dad and decided that I never wanted to act or feel that way again. Because when I was married to him, I was hell bent on catching him in lies. Like, I needed proof so I could get him to admit the truth. And I would go to great lengths to get that proof. And because I needed him to admit it to me, it was a big deal. I needed that validation. I needed to be right. And there was this one time, and it was like towards the end of our marriage, it was really like the last few months, things were really unraveling at that point. And I suspected that he was smoking weed. And in my attempt to control the environment in our home, I had tried to ban weed. And for some reason, he could drink but not smoke weed. And I think that maybe I had already surrendered that I wasn't winning the battle against alcohol, but I was still trying to hold strong with my battle against weed. Like I was just hanging on to try to control anything that I could. And I'm not, you know, sure why I even thought one was better than the other or that I could control it, but that's how we get in the situations that we get in, how we end up losing control. None of it really makes sense. So on this particular day, I suspected that he had a bag of weed in his pocket. So I thought I had a great opportunity to prove myself right and make him admit something. So I chased him through the house, then outside and around the house, and then back through the front door into the house again. And as I got to the back door, he got through it before I got there and held it shut. It was a glass door and was telling me just to stop. And in that moment, I could see that I was consumed. I was consumed with his behavior and trying to control it. And I think that part of me believed if I could prove that he was lying in a way that was just so solid that he couldn't deny it anymore, that something would change. But in that moment of defeat, I could really see myself and my behavior and my obsession with getting to the truth. And it was just hurting me. My obsession was with changing him so that I could be okay, but it was just hurting me. So I've been down that road of being obsessed with catching people in lies and trying to make them stop. But that just led to me being out of control. And so now I want to offer what I think now when somebody who's struggling with addiction is lying to me. So these are the things that I was thinking when I knew that my daughter was lying to me. Like, of course she's lying. <laughs> Why would she tell me the truth if the truth has negative consequences, even if that negative consequence is how I think about her? And I don't take it personal. It has nothing to do with me. Lies have to do with the person who's telling them, not the person that they're being told to. So if somebody lies to me, it's their character that's in question, not mine. The only time that's a problem is if I make it mean something 
bad about me that I was lied to. That's when it gets painful. And I would try to remember that the drug was in control, not my daughter. She didn't lie to me like that before. And then I have this saying about like, if you swim with sharks, they're going to act like sharks. So use your shark protocol and expect shark behavior. And that means like, never put yourself in a situation where you have to rely on them to tell you the truth. So if they ask you for $20 and you want them to promise you that they'll buy the food with or whatever they say they're going to buy with the $20 and not drugs, then you know the money's going to go straight to drugs. So you know that you're being lied to. And it's not that I'm condoning lying or saying that it's okay. What I'm saying is you can't control if somebody lies to you and that it's not worth your peace of mind to get this huge emotional charge and reaction to it. I believe that you should protect yourself from lies. Like what I was saying before, if you swim with sharks, they act like sharks. Like don't be surprised (laughs) when they act like a shark. So I believe you should protect yourself and have boundaries and not rely on your child to tell the truth. So that's totally different than me saying that it's just okay. This is about you and your peace of mind. I'm just telling you how to take the emotional charge out of it so that you can remain peaceful and happy. So remember earlier when I told you what the question was, can I ever trust trust my child again? I said, that's the wrong question. The correct question is, can you trust yourself? As long as you trust yourself to be able to handle any situation, then you don't have to trust the other person. I trust myself, so I don't even think about if my daughter is lying to me or not, which at this point is not even an issue. She's sober. She has a job. She's supporting herself financially. She's living in sober living. Like there's no need for me to even think about her lying to me or not right now. But if she was in active addiction and called and asked me for money, it wouldn't be about whether I trusted her or not. It would be about me trusting myself, trusting that I will follow my boundaries. And if I don't follow my boundaries, I still have my own back. And when it comes to trust or anything else for that matter, it's always about bringing it back around to yourself and what you can control. It's never about your child or anything outside of you. Even if you've given your trust to the wrong people in the past and then made it mean that you can't trust yourself, you can still start building that trust again. If you struggle to make decisions and you have to do a lot of polling and talk to everyone about it, or you just procrastinate making decisions, it's because you don't trust yourself. There's a difference between doing research to make an informed decision and being afraid to decide so you keep asking other people for their opinion. It feels totally different. Your energy in the situation is different. You might not even realize that you don't trust yourself because you've been looking for trust in others for so long that it just feels normal to you. But if any of this is sounding familiar and you're starting to see that you might not trust yourself, then just sit with that knowledge. It's okay that you don't trust yourself. Don't judge yourself for it. Have compassion This is just useful information that's good for you to know. And if you don't see it, then you can't change it. But since you do see it, that means things can be different now. It means that instead of relying on someone you don't trust to tell you the truth, then you can start building trust with yourself and rely on yourself. It also takes a lot of pressure off of you and the relationship. 
It makes the relationship easier. When my daughter was a minor and still lived at my house, my judgment of a situation was final. Like I didn't have to rely on her to tell me the truth before I upheld a boundary. So if I thought she was outside our house selling or buying drugs because there were five cars in front of my house when she wasn't even allowed to have people over or be outside, I didn't need her to admit to anything. Of course, she tried to volunteer that one person brought her a drink from Quick Trip and another person was having a bad day and needed to see her. And she had all these reasons that all the people were there. But I didn't even ask or argue or try to prove anything. I just went with what I believed and I took action based on that. I didn't have to spend hours fighting or trying to drag the truth out of her or losing my mind because she wouldn't tell me the truth. I just had to trust myself. And that's so much more freeing than when I was chasing her dad around the house trying to prove that he was lying to me, trying to get evidence so that he would change. There was no emotional charge because she lied about why people were at the house. I didn't have to add to the chaos. I just knew what happened. And that was enough because I didn't make it mean anything about me that she was lying. Of course she lied. She wanted drugs and she didn't want to get grounded. So the next time your child lies to you, if you feel highly emotional about it, get curious. Ask yourself what you're making it mean about you. Most of the time, you're probably making it mean that you're a bad parent or that there's something wrong with you. That's what it seems to always go back to. Ask yourself why you need them to admit the truth. Do you think if they admit the truth that they will suddenly understand everything that you've been trying to explain to them? And then once they suddenly understand that they will change? Do you feel that it will be less yucky feeling if you get them to admit they lied before you uphold your boundary? I mean, that one's like sneaky. It's because you want them to be okay with your boundaries. And then if you get them to admit the lie, then it's easier to hold your boundary because then in some way they're kind of agreeing to it. Take some time with those questions. Keep asking yourself. Your reaction to somebody else's lying, especially if it's highly charged for you, won't change overnight. It's going to take time for you to change your belief that somehow you're letting them get away with it if you don't overreact. But from there, focus on trusting yourself. If you want to know how to trust yourself. I've already made two episodes about it. There's an episode on self-confidence, which is going to lead to self-trust, and an episode on decision-making. Because as I mentioned before, you can see how you do or don't uh, trust yourself when it comes to making decisions. So I make made a whole podcast about decision making because just going through that process will build your confidence and trust. So I'll put those episodes in the show notes in case you haven't listened to them yet. And so that's your homework. Create your own security and trust in yourself so you don't need it from anyone else. That's all I have for now, but I will be back for real this time (laughs) with more next week. Thank you for listening to this episode. If you want to learn more about my work, go to heatherrosscoaching.com. If you want to help other parents who are struggling with a child's addiction, you can do it two different ways. First, you can share the podcast with them directly, or you can share it on your social media. Second, you can leave a review. Talk to you next week.